apologies for running a little bit late. This is like a sellout concert because we obviously didn't have enough chairs. <laughs> Uh, but we certainly really appreciate your support. So um, we, we will start kicking it off. Uh, my name's Adam Bradfield. I'm one of the senior partners in the TNR Auden Assurance Practice. Uh, I've got Richard and Kevin here with me today as well and, and some of our team. Um, the first speaker I'd like to introduce is Carmen Ridley. So hands up who has been to a, a Carmen Ridley session before probably half the room. For the other half, you're in for a treat because uh, Carmen is probably um, Australia's leading expert in financial reporting and we don't call it financial reporting anymore, we call it external reporting apparently because there's so much happening in the reporting space that's not just financial statement related. So um, Carmen was a, a former member on the AASB for the maximum term of nine years. Uh, so uh, she's as good as, as good as it gets. She's the guru and uh, please welcome Carmen. Thank you. Thanks Adam and welcome everyone. So as Adam pointed out, we are gonna talk external reporting, not just financial reporting. And I will link things back to your financial statements, but I'm not gonna stand here and announce for the next hour and whatever, if there's a major new standard and go through the details on that. We're actually not gonna talk that long about accounting standards. We're gonna talk more about other things that are happening. Now what Adam didn't say, and he did say yesterday, so I was grateful he didn't say it today, is yesterday he told everyone I loved really, really hard questions. So please keep asking us throughout. Don't necessarily love hard questions, but I do love questions. So please, as we go through, interrupt me and ask any questions um, that we that you hear about, um, particularly on the topics that we'll cover, because some of them may be a little bit confronting. I have some sessions in there that aren't very cheery sessions, but certainly things that everybody needs to think about. So if we get started, see the technology things today. So what we're going to go through is we are going to talk through accounting standards. So there's nothing major happening, but there are a couple of things that you need to think about, particularly some standards that aren't necessarily effective, but may require some work from your perspective. We're then going to look at the regulatory activity. So what have ASIC and the ACNC been up to? We're going to talk about the current reporting season. We hopefully are in a really unique season because it is not a cheery season that we are in. There's, there's not a lot of positive things that I'm going to put up in that section and that's my really depressing section. And then we're going to finish off with sustainability. I'm not going to talk to you about scope one, two and three emissions. That is not my area of expertise. What we're going to cover off is greenwashing and we're going to cover off how your inputs and assumptions might need to change when you are preparing financial statements. So that's the agenda for the next hour and 20 minutes or so. So start with accounting standards. <laughs> the good news, there's only two new standards that you really need to think about at 30 June. There are more than two standards that are effective, but the other standards just change effective dates. So they push them out. So we're not gonna talk through those. The first one relates to not-for-profits only. And anyone in the not-for-profit space would probably be aware there are a number of issues for accounting for revenue, particularly the interaction between AASB 15 and AASB 1058. So the AASB undertook a short-term narrow scope project, which was to look and say if effectively we could wave a magic wand to make life easier in respect of this standard, what could we do? There was a lot of issues that came out of that, but not a lot of quick fixes for it. So a couple of things that came out of this project, and then I'll talk about what's happening on a longer term. The first is in relation to accounting for upfront fees. So there was a staff FAQ on that, but it was about a private school. So it dealt with waitlist fees and enrolment fees for a private school. And the feedback that we got when we did that work was that we're not a private school, it's not relevant to us. It was, because it was all about the principle. However, what the board have decided to do is add a specific example to SB 15 that assists not-for-profits in dealing with upfront fees. So if you've got joining fees, if you've got any setup fees, any other upfront fees, that example will help you work through it. it. Doesn't change the standard, but putting it into the standard itself gives it authority. A staff FAQ actually has no authority. 
The second change in relation to that standard is something that hopefully is very good news for a lot of not-for-profits. So if you have concessionary or peppercorn leases, there was a temporary exemption that was put in the standard that said that you don't need to fair value the right of use asset. You can just record it at cost. And every time I spoke to not-for-profits, they would say to me, when's this temporary exemption gonna be lifted? It's gonna be an absolute nightmare when it is. You know, please delay it as long as possible. The outcome from this project is that it has been made a permanent exemption. Permanent as long as anything can be. A new board could come in and change their mind, but it would be a very brave board who did that. So not-for-profits with peppercorns concessionary leases don't need to worry about that. that's going to have to be fair valued in the future. You can keep recording it at least liability, which is probably not material, but just be aware you do have to disclose the nature and extent of your reliance on peppercorn leases, so that disclosure still stands. The next one is in relation to an international standard, and it's the annual improvements project. This isn't annual anymore, it's probably every two to three years, and if you can imagine, there are a number of jurisdictions who use these international standards. And people go back to the board and say, can they clarify this? Is this quite right? And they often accumulate many kind of minor changes. And they issue them as part of this annual improvements project. I'm not going to talk through all of them. There's just a couple I'm going to pick on. The first is ISB 116. So it's in regards to if you've installed, say, plant and equipment, to make something. Let's say I'm making my clicker and it's installed, there's something being spat out of the machine. It's just not quite right. It's a bit, it can be sold, it's just not the way I really want it to be. So what used to happen is the sale of these samples or the things that weren't quite right, we would be able to offset them against the value of the plant and equipment. What this clarification says is you can't do that anymore. If you are selling something, regardless of whether it's a sample or it's not quite its intended use, you have to record it as a sale proceed. Now, when this came out, I went, well, okay, it's probably not going to affect a lot of people. I think I've got three queries on it in the first week that it had been issued. So it obviously does have impact for people. So just be aware of that. The second one I'm going to talk about is something that I will come back a lot during the session and is around onerous contracts. <laughs> really, it's a sellout concert, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, come on. <laughs> um, so to do with onerous contracts, and what this standard does is it just provides some clarification about the costs that we need to think about when we are trying to determine whether a contract is onerous. Now why do we care? Because if you have an onerous contract, so a contract where the costs to undertake the contract are higher than the benefits you will get, the revenue you will get, you have to recognize that loss immediately. You can't spread it over the period, it's got to be recognized immediately. Why will I talk about onerous contracts a lot throughout this session? Because of the rising inflation that we've got. If you have found yourself that you have locked into fixed price contracts, you might end up with an onerous contract because prices have gone up. Um, so something we're expecting to see a fair amount. So we would strongly encourage you to make sure that you are looking at any contracts that you've agreed, any contracts you've tendered. You've probably put a contingency or a margin in there. Depends how big that contingency or margin is in relation to that. I'm not going to talk through any of the others unless anyone's got any questions or comments on any of those. So happy to answer anything on those ones. So that's it. They are the only new standards we really have to think about at 30 June 23. So nothing major to think about. What we're going to do now is talk about a couple of standards that are not yet effective. Now there is only two reasons I ever talk about standards that aren't yet effective. Reason number one is because it might be in your interest to early adopt it. Reason number two is you might have to do some work prior to it becoming effective. So we've got one of each. This is the one where it might actually be beneficial for you to early adopt this standard. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of a history lesson. Back in 2020, the International Board changed the definition of a current liability. And they changed it to this thing on the left hand side. I'll move slightly this way so you guys can see. So effectively what they did was they removed the word unconditional. And nobody had an issue with that because they said nothing's unconditional. If you breach a bank covenant, the bank has the right to call on that debt. So nothing's unconditional. So that everyone was fine with that. 
However, when the International Board issued their standard in 2020, they included a paragraph that talked about covenants that were effective at a future date and said that if you don't meet that covenant at the year end, even though it's not going to be tested until 12 months down the track, it all is classified as current. There was uproar. It was not a very popular adjustment, and particularly because it had never actually been put out for public comment. So there's been lots of to and fro up to that date. The result of that was in late 2022, the International Board issued a revised standard to the revised standard, which becomes effective from 1st of January 2024. And it relates to covenants. So if we move over to this side, what it says is we have to think very carefully about the date that the information is being tested for the covenants. So let's say we're a junior end. Do I have a bank covenant, say it's linked to current ratio, and it's based on the current ratio at 30 June? If it is, we look at it and we say, did we meet that covenant at 30 June? And if we did meet it, we just do our normal current, non-current split. If we didn't meet it, it's classified as current. That's what we're all used to doing. The difference is where the covenant is tested after the year end. So let's say my current ratio is tested at 31 August and it's based on information as at that date. What the amendment says is you completely ignore that for the purpose of classifying your liabilities between current and non-current. The reason that this has got so much interest in Australia is because in Australia we have annual review clauses in the vast majority of bank loans. Now what we've previously said is if you had an annual review clause, that whole debt was classified as current because you did not have a right to defer settlement for at least 12 months. What this amendment says is based on the terms of that annual review clause, if it talks about an adverse material effect in your finances and that is tested after the year end based on information at that date, you don't take it into account as part of your current non-current classification. So consequently, for many of you, it might be the situation that your debts can be moved instead of being 100% current to partly current, partly non-current in relation to that. So definitely worth looking at this and making sure that you've considered whether it has an impact. So do you want to make any comments on that one, Adam? I'm sorting out chairs. You're sorting out chairs, okay. <laughs> It's probably interesting, Carmen, because whilst you may end up then with your, your debt non-current at 30 June, if it's tested at, say, 31 August, but if you don't meet that ratio at 31 August, what it does come into is you go and concern assessment. Correct. So you might have that mismatch where you've got go and concern issues, but your balance sheet looks you know, good at 30, 30 June, but you've then got these other disclosures because of, because of that. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a good point about going concern. So if at 31 August it was tested and you had major going concern issues, going concern is one of the things that is an adjusting post balance sheet event. So consequently, you would have to classify it all as current. If you didn't meet it and it still didn't cause going concern issues, wouldn't be an issue, but absolutely going concern needs to be looked at in relation to that. The next standard is a standard that may require a little bit of work for you to do. And it's in relation to insurance. Now most of you are probably reading that first sentence and thinking well that's exactly where I am, I'm just going to switch off from the next bit she's going to talk about. And to be honest, that's where I've been since SSB 17 was issued. I don't have clients that are insurance companies, I'm not interested in insurance accounting. So I've had my head in the sand. However, my inbox keeps getting full with lots of things about SSB 17 for non-insurance companies. And given what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, kind of figured I probably shouldn't ignore this standard completely. It becomes effective 31 December 2023. So I started doing some work into this standard for non-insurance companies, which is what everybody in the room is. And got a little bit of a rude awakening when I realized how many things the International Board believe our insurance contracts. So what do they think might meet that definition? Warranties, financial guarantees, and fixed fee service contracts in particular. They're the ones we are going to focus on. So this is not going to be a session about how to do insurance accounting for two reasons. Firstly, it's very hard and it would take me forever to explain. Secondly, don't know it well enough to explain. 
what we're going to do is focus on the scope because that's really the key for you. You need to determine today whether you have got any potential contracts that are in the scope of SSB 17. And if you do, we then need to deal with how do we account for that. But your real focus is are you in or are you not? So we're going to spend some time looking at the definition and we are then going to spend some time looking at some of the exclusions in this particular standard. So if we look at the definition, what actually is an insurance contract? Defined at the top of the slide. A contract under which one party accepts significant insurance risk from another party by agreeing to compensate the policyholder if a specified uncertain future event adversely affects the policyholder. What on earth does that mean? Because you are probably all still sat there going, we don't have any of these. So let's work through it. Step one is we have to have a contract. Now we know from SSB 15, a contract can be written, can be verbal, can be implied. So you may have a written, very detailed contract, but you may also have a customary business practice that if something goes wrong with a particular thing that you've sold, you fix it for your customers as a goodwill thing. That's an implied contract if that's known. So consequently, it doesn't need to be a written contract. Step number two is we have to compensate the policyholder for a specified uncertain event. It doesn't matter how likely that event is. It's not about probability. It is all about is there an uncertain future event and is there compensation? That compensation might be cash. If something happens, I actually pay you amount. Or it could be something in kind. If something happens, I will fix something for you. So the compensation type at this stage does not matter in working out whether we have an insurance contract or not. Step number three is there has to be an adverse effect on the policyholder. So let's say I'm from Melbourne. I was woken up a few nights ago by the earthquake that happened in Melbourne at 11.41 p.m. Let's say I took an insurance policy out that said if there's an earthquake in Melbourne, somebody was going to pay me some money. That's just gambling. I don't have any adverse impact. If, however, I took out a policy that said if there was an earthquake in Melbourne and my property suffered adverse impact, so therefore I had to fix it, then it's an insurance contract. So the policyholder has to have an adverse impact. Step number four, the insurer has to accept significant insurance risk. So firstly, what's insurance risk? Insurance risk is defined as anything that is not financial risk. So financial risk is where we've got some price changes based on a rate, an index, etc. If it's not that, it's insurance risk. How do we know whether it's significant or not? Judgment call. So what the issuer of the contract is meant to do is model a number of outcomes. If they've modeled those outcomes and the absolute worst case scenario is they can't make a loss, then it's not significant insurance risk, but it's a judgment call around that. So that's the definition. If we have a look now at the exclusions, now the reason it's important to look at the exclusions is you might find that you are in the definition of an insurance contract, but you actually can be kicked back out. And that's our aim, is to get out of SSB 17, because as I said, the accounting is not easy. There is a significant number of choices and nuances in this particular standard. The good news for everybody is if you are a policy holder, you are not in this standard. So we all hold insurance policies. This is all about the issuer of the contract. Second one is a warranty. So we said that a warranty probably meets the definition. So you have to think about any warranties that you issue, either via a formal contract or via an implied contract. So let's use some examples. I go to Harvey Norman and I buy a washing machine. And Harvey Norman say to me, would you like to buy an extended warranty? We will run that warranty. If you've got any issues, you contact us and we will send out Harvey Norman staff to fix that. That is a warranty that is issued by the retailer in connection with the sale of my washing machine outside of the scope of SSB 17 because this allows me to be kicked back out. I go to Harvey Norman and I buy my washing machine and they say, would you like the extended warranty? The extended warranty is operated by Adams Company. If anything goes wrong, you contact Adams Company and Adam will send out the staff to fix your washing machine. That is not part of this exemption and Adam would have to account for that warranty in accordance with SSB 17. 
if I go to Harvey Norman and I buy my washing machine and they say, would you like to buy the extended warranty? And I say, no, thank you. They say, no problem. At any time in the next 12 months, you can come in and you can purchase that extended warranty on that washing machine. This is where we start getting into judgment because this says in connection with the sale of the washing machine, how far along the track does it need to be until it's not in connection with the sale, until it's actually a separate transaction? Judgment call, differing views around that. So you can see that if you are issuing any warranties, it could be back-to-back -back warranties with a manufacturer, it could be an extended warranty, whatever it is, we have to start considering, are we in the scope of this standard because do we have an insurance contract and are we out of the standard or are we in it? The real key is making sure we've got the documentation because down the track when someone says, why aren't we doing this accounting? Because prima facie it looks like we should be in. We need to have that documentation to think about this. The next one relates to financial guarantee contracts. So let's say that we have a deed of cross guarantee in place because it allows us to avoid lodging certain financial statements with ASIC and many entities do. That could be covered. We've given a guarantee to a subsidiary to allow them to take out a loan. We've given a guarantee to somebody else for whatever reason. So prima facie looks like it meets the definition of an insurance contract. The exemption within SB 17 says that financial guarantee contracts are out unless you have explicitly asserted that you believe this contract is an insurance contract and have previously applied insurance accounting. I am not aware of any entity that I have ever dealt with who has explicitly asserted that and dealt with these financial guarantees in accordance with insurance accounting. So I would expect that for most of you, you're out. But again, it's that documentation to think about. Contingent consideration on a business combination. So if revenue exceeds X or if revenue is below Y, there will be some more money that's paid or might be refunded back. Again, could meet the definition of an insurance contract, but it allows us to be back out. Any comments on those before I move on to the last one? So let's move on to our fee-for-service contracts. And the example that I'm going to use is roadside assistance. So we are in Queensland. I don't know who runs your roadside assistance here. So I'm going to use my example of RACV in, in Melbourne. So RACV, I can pay, I don't know, $300, whatever it is, and I can call them every time I lock the keys in the car, every time I have a flat battery, every time I've run out of petrol. As many times as I want for that $300. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about our fee-for-service contracts. So, prima facie, they meet the definition of an insurance contract. However, there is possible exemptions if the contract meets three criteria that are shown there on the slide. And if they meet those criteria, you could choose to account for that contract within SSB 15 rather than SSB 17. The revenue standard is painful too, and it's got lots of nuances, but it's way easier than SSB 17. So let's have a look at the exemptions. The first one is that the entity who is issuing the contract does not perform a risk assessment. So effectively, if I say, okay, I'm going to offer everybody roadside assistance and I'm going to charge everybody in the room the same price, then that would meet the criteria. If, however, I said, well, I look at Adam and Adam's got a great car, barely ever calls out, I've looked at the history of that, don't really expect him to use the service very much, I'm going to charge him 150 bucks. Whereas if I look at Kevin, I go, his car's not so great, he's a right pain. If I look at the history, he's charged, he's called out no matter how many times, then I'm going to charge him $400. You should, yeah. I should, yeah, yeah. Um, then that's a risk assessment that I'm performing. I fail that criteria. So consequently, that contract is in SSB 17. The next one is I have to provide a service. I can't provide cash. So on the call out, I turn up and I actually get the keys out of the car. I put petrol in to allow the car to start. If I turn up and I look and I go, it's going to be costly that, I'll just hand 500 bucks over. Then that again fails that particular criteria. So it has to be about providing a service. The last criteria is that the insurance risk arises around how many times the customer uses the service. So with my roadside assistance example, it's all about how many times I'm called out. 
It's not about the cost of the service, because the cost is pretty much the same. It's about the number of times. If I contrast that to a prepaid funeral plan, which could also meet the definition of an insurance contract, depending on the terms and conditions. Generally, we all only die once. Consequently, we're only using the service of a funeral plan once. So the risk there, it's about the cost of that service, not about how many times it will be used. So these three criteria have to be met for any fixed fee service contracts that we think about. So you have to think, are you offering anything that is effectively one price, use the service as much as you want? And does it meet the definition of an insurance contract? If it does, does it then meet these three criteria and can we get back out? So you can see it's around the nuances in this standard, the documentation where you have to think about it. We cannot all stick our heads in the sand about this standard, unfortunately, anymore. Um, so it kicks in 31 December 2023, 30 June 2024. Not yet effective but it is retrospectively applied. So if it is relevant to you, you will have to restate comparatives. Questions, comments at all on that one? Death, reset, just everyone's gone that. We're just back to sticking our heads in the sand on this one. All right, that's it on the new standards, but I just want to give you a little bit of an update on some of the projects the ISB are working on. You may or may not be aware that the ISB proposed a third tier of accounting standards for certain not-for-profits. So we currently have tier one, which is our full IFRS. We have tier two, which is our simplified disclosure. And the proposal was for a tier three. Much simplified accounting, much simplified disclosures for certain smaller not-for-profits. It was out for a six month comment period. The comment period ended on the 31st of March. And the board had the most comments on this than pretty much they've ever had on any other um, consultation. The great news is that the board has decided that this project should proceed and has asked the staff to go ahead and start writing an exposure draft. The not so great news is the timing in the bottom bullet point on that slide. So the latest staff paper that went to the board suggested that an exposure draft would be out by the end of 2024. Realistically, there'll be another six month comment period. We are unlikely to have a standard therefore before 2026. That's not great when it's something that people were really excited about. If I take all of my SSB hats off, I'm really hoping that it's an absolute worst case deadline and it moves much quicker than this because it really is something that people are excited about. So if you are in that not-for-profit space, what does it mean? When this standard is issued, you will not necessarily be able to do special purpose financial statements anymore because this will actually require you to do general purpose for certain entities, the same as we've had in the for-profit space. However, if you are doing special purpose, you've pretty much got until 2026, 2027 to be able to do that. As long as you have determined that you are a non-reporting entity, special purpose financials will still exist in the not-for-profit space. The other project that the ISB have been working on is a number of research projects. So as part of that tier three, what they did was they reviewed the financial statements of 260 um, entities that had lodged with the ACNC. They're all medium entities, so between that 500,000 and 3 million. And it's interesting to see that nearly 80% of them are still lodging special purpose financial statements. So they're still deeming they are non-reporting, and hence it is not reasonable to expect the existence of users relying on that general purpose financial statements. So consequently, it is something, as I said, Yeah. So you are still able to do that, and as I say, up till probably 2026, 2027. One of the things that I guess is a bit of disappointing on this slide is in respect of the disclosures. So back in 2019, there was a requirement included in the accounting standards that said that if you are a not-for-profit, and if you are required to comply with ISB 1054, which all ACNC registered entities are, you are required to disclose your compliance with recognition and measurement standards within your special purpose financial statements. The choice of disclosure that you had is that you could say, yes, we comply with all recognition and measurement, 
we comply with some and these are the ones we don't or we've got absolutely no idea whether we do or we don't. So it wasn't an onerous requirement necessarily. But if we look, so these financial statements were December 20, June 2021, a couple of years after this requirement became effective, we can see that we've still got 57% of these entities who aren't complying. Now what that means is as a user, if you read those financial statements, you don't actually know how those numbers are being put together in relation to accounting standards. You might have accounting policies, you might not, but we need to be quite clear for the users how those numbers are being put together to allow us to interpret them. So anyone in the room who is involved in a not-for-profit who is preparing special purpose financial statements, please make sure, it's not gonna work as far away, is it? Please make sure that you do actually have that disclosure if you are required to comply with 1054, which is ACNC registered entities and any other legislation that requires compliance with accounting standards. For the for-profits in the room, if you are preparing special purpose accounts and the reason that you're preparing those is because you're using the grandfathering in the standards which says you might have a document that requires you to prepare financial statements in accordance with Australian accounting standards but that document was issued prior to 1st of July 21 you also still have a requirement to disclose compliance with recognition and measurement the difference between for-profits and not-for-profits is the standards don't allow a for-profit to say we've got absolutely no idea. The for-profits have to say we either comply or we don't comply with A, B and C and describe what that A, B and C are. So just a reminder for those who are doing special purpose, you may still have some disclosure requirements around this. Questions or comments at all on, on that? Post-implementation reviews is also something that will be of interest to particularly the not-for-profits in the room. And a post-implementation review is where the IISB have the opportunity to say, we've issued a standard. Is it doing what we expected it to do? So internationally, the international board look after their own standards. These are on domestic standards that were issued in Australia. So predominantly in the not-for-profit space. I mentioned earlier when I talked about the new standards that were effective and I said there was a short-term narrow scope project around revenue to try and wave the magic wand and see if anything could be changed quickly. Mostly they couldn't be. So consequently this is where the post-implementation review comes in. So effectively the board has gone out to stakeholders again, I think it was a five month comment period, to say what are your issues with these particular standards. There was a number of issues raised with 1058 and 15 in that income space and the board, it, nothing has gone to the board yet in relation to this, the comment period ended the 31st of March but there is another board meeting in just over two weeks time, I expect that we will see something to go there. The outcomes of this could be that it's nothing to see here, we really haven't had any major complaints. It could be that the board decide extra educational material is required. It could be that some narrow scope amendments to the standards are issued, or it could be that the standards are thrown up, thrown in the bin and start again from scratch, which I think for many people is what they're hoping might happen in that income for the not-for-profit space. At this point, we're not sure. The other area where there was a number of issues raised was in respect of control and consolidation in the not-for-profits. So if you've got two companies limited by guarantee, for example, how do we know if one controls the other, particularly around those exposure to variable returns? So we might see some amendments in that particular area. So watch this space for this one. We may see some changes, we may not see some changes, but there will definitely be something put out by the board in relation to that. That's it on the standards. That's it from the double SB perspective. So <coughs> any comments at all, questions on those? Yeah. Question going back to you, 101. Yes. Um, does it clarify the scenario? You know you've got right out of five year loan. Yep. Then the bank's up and willing to sneak in, re reserve the right to annually review your performance, blah, blah, which was often like a way to get out by the bill. 
Yeah, so that's the annual review clauses that I was talking about. So it depends it doesn't on. Specifically say covenant, so it just says a black and white like that. Yeah, so I caveated my answer with it depends on the terms and conditions. Yeah, sure. If your annual review clause is a pretty much, we'll look at it and if we decide we're going to pull it at any time, nothing changes. That's still current. It's where it's an annual review clause that is linked to material, you know, adverse financial, whatever it's called, or something within there. But yeah, if it's that blanket one that they like to throw in some times nothing's changed because you can't control what they're going to do yeah yeah all right so let's move on and look at what the regulators have been up to so we'll start with the ACNC in that not-for-profit space you will be familiar that last year you had to disclose key management personnel remuneration for the first time if you were preparing special purpose financial statements with a view that this year that disclosure requirement is going to be expanded to all material related party transactions. Now it is only relevant if you are preparing special purpose financial statements, because if you did general purpose you're already doing it. And it's also relevant for small charities. Now small charities don't prepare financial statements, they only prepare an annual information statement. So consequently, all charities will be required to report in the AIS any material related party transactions. Haven't seen anything overly official, but I understand that the option that has been chosen is there will be a predefined list of this is the type of related party transaction and you tick that list. I don't think the dollar amounts are going to be included, but you will need to tick if any of these related party transactions have happened. And that's the way it will be in the AIS. So for small charities, that's all they do. Medium or large charities in their special purpose financial statements, they are required to disclose related party transactions in accordance with SSB 124, which is the related party disclosure standard, or SSB 1060, which is our tier two disclosure standard. To be honest, the requirements are pretty much identical. I would choose 1060 only because the wording is slightly nicer. It's a bit more plain English than 124. The key to this is making sure you have captured the information. And don't try and capture the information when the auditors turn up and tell you you need this note because it can be quite painful to, to um, try and collect. You're looking at, for example, key management personnel um, and the entities they control are related entities to them, related parties to those key management personnel. It can be quite painful to collect. And a key message is if you have any key management personnel leaving during the year, you've got to collect this information before they actually walk out the door because the disclosures are for the whole year. So have you got a policy and process in place to be actually capturing this information if you are currently doing special purpose financial statements and you are lodging them with the ACNC. The ACNC will definitely be monitoring this because it is a real key project for them. The other change in respect of disclosures is they have introduced a choice on special purpose financial statements. So the list of the mandatory standards is getting quite long now. What they've said is you can continue to comply with all of those disclosure requirements in the standards or you can choose to apply the relevant paragraphs, which are shown on here, from tier two, from SSB 1060. I guess my recommendation is if you're a new charity or you suddenly move to medium or large, then I'd probably do the 1060, again, because it's more plain English. If you are just ticking along and you've been doing your financial statements for years, as long as you are complying with the relevant requirements in that first bullet point, I don't think I'd switch because I think you're just creating work for yourselves without really any benefit for that. But there is a choice there within the standards. So a little bit of change for the not-for-profits in this aspect. So let's have a look at ASIC and what ASIC have been up to. The focus areas here are the 31 December 22 ones, and that's because they don't release the June ones until probably middle of June. Whether you are governed by ASIC or not, it doesn't matter. These focus areas are equally relevant to every single entity. What we have is the corporate regulator telling us that this is the areas where they expect to see errors or they expect to see attention by directors and preparers. 
To be honest, I think the list at June will be pretty identical to this. It was pretty identical to the June last year as well, but given the current environment, I don't think things will change. So I'm just going to talk briefly through each of them. The first one is to do with asset values. Asset values means impairment in assets world. So what we're looking at there is both financial and non-financial assets. So when we talk about non-financial, we're talking about your infrastructure, your property, plant and equipment. And I will keep coming back to impairment through the session. One of the indicators to assess for impairment is market interest rates have increased. Market interest rates have increased. Therefore, I think it is very difficult, if not impossible, for any entity to tell me there is no impairment indicators this year. So I would expect every one of you to be doing recoverable amount testing. You can't say you haven't got an indicator and move on, which is often what we see in previous years. They talk about property, they talk about um, inventory, they talk about deferred tax assets. So we'll talk about inventory a little bit later, but a key is deferred tax assets. If you are recognising that on your balance sheet, just make sure that it is still probable that you are likely to recover those. Because what we often see with DTAs is people recognise them and they kind of go, well, they're on here, they've been on here and we just don't need to remove them. The amount hasn't changed. You still need to assess every year whether it is probable you're going to utilise it in the foreseeable future. And unfortunately, if it's not, you need to write them off, take them back off the balance sheet, um, which isn't a great outcome because you're recognising your expense, but it's something that is still covered by impairment. The other area for impairment is expected credit loss, which is the fancy terminology for bad debt provisions. Obviously, when we talk about the economic environment a little bit later, we are seeing increases in bad debt provisions because counterparties are struggling to pay. So ASIC, very much looking at this if you are regulated by ASIC. If not, would encourage you all to make sure that you spend some time looking at your bad debt provisions this year. Just because you haven't had any in the past doesn't mean that you won't have any going forward. One of the things that's important to remember with our bad debt provisions is the debt doesn't necessarily need to be bad before you put a provision in. It's all about what do we expect to happen. And if you might get payment in, say, 12 months, you've agreed a payment plan, there is still an expected credit loss because of the time value of money. So even though you might get the $100 invoice in 12 months' time, $100 in 12 months' time is not worth $100 today. So there is still an expected credit loss element to that. The next one is in relation to provisions, and I said I would talk about an onerous contract a few times. It's going to be talked about once more after this, so just make sure that you have looked at that. Lease make good provisions. We are seeing a number of changes to leases that are happening. So you might have put through a make good provision, but you were intending to do that make good in 10 years time because you were going to renew an option on your lease. You might not be going to renew that option now because half of your staff are working virtually and why am I paying for three floors of a building when I only use one? So consequently, you might be planning on getting rid of two floors, which means the make good is needed much sooner than you thought. So making sure that you've reassessed those particular provisions. Any other rehabilitation type provisions? And unfortunately, we are expecting to see a number of restructuring provisions that are happening this year. Um, between now and the 30th of June, we will see lots of media releases around redundancies. Because in order to recognise a restructuring provision, we have to have announced to the relevant people and have a formal plan in place prior to year end. So we always see a flood of these in order that entities can recognise these provisions at 30th of June. The other area that ASIC have highlighted, and we've talked about financial guarantee contracts in respect of insurance, they're also talking about it in respect of provisions. So if we issue a financial guarantee, we generally disclose it as a contingent liability. Think about who you've issued the guarantee to and think about their results and how are they performing. Has that actually crystallised into a probable liability? Because if they're struggling, we might actually need to step in and actually have a liability in respect of that. So a fair bit of work to do on provisions. We really have to think about them in the current environment and not just roll them forward. Solvency and going concern, fairly self-explanatory, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Events after the reporting period, I'll also cover that later on when we talk about the um, reporting environment. Um, I guess the thing that I'll say now is just think about 
how you actually identify events after your reporting period. If I talk to the auditors in the room, they will tell me they have a very detailed process, they have an audit program, and they work through that, then they do another double check prior to the accounts being signed. For preparers, you generally don't have such a defined process to think about. So, as I'm, I will say, we'll come back to it a little bit later on, but just think about how you identify anything that happens between that 1st of July and the date you sign your accounts, because it can have some quite significant impacts. And the people who have to do the most work, if there is these events, are you guys as preparers, um, because you have to often do a last minute scramble to change the financials. The last one is in respect of disclosures. Now, ASIC do write these predominantly for listeds, so consequently they use that terminology of investor. You may not have direct investors, but think about that term as your primary user. So put yourself in the shoes of the primary user, and are you telling them the story? Are you actually giving them the story of your financial performance, your financial position, the different transactions you've had, the different changes in business operations that you might have? Not the boilerplate disclosures that you've grabbed from a set of model accounts, not the same disclosures you necessarily had last year. We really need to be tailoring those particular disclosures to make sure we are telling our specific story. Any comments at all on any of those focus areas? The other thing that ASIC do is their restatements. So this is where ASIC review financial statements. Predominantly they are listed entities, but not necessarily always. And they look at the financial statements and they say, this doesn't seem to make sense, we think something's wrong here, we think something's missing. We get a media release, doesn't necessarily always tell us a full story, but it is certainly something that I would recommend, whether you are governed by ASIC or not, have a read of some of these because it gives you a good insight into where we see some very big entities making some mistakes. The funny little references at the beginning of each of the entity name is the ASIC media release. So that is exactly where you find it if that's what you Google. So if we look at the topics, I talked about impairment or asset values being ASIC's number one focus area. The reason it is generally ASIC's number one focus area is because that is the area they have the most misstatements or restatements when they're reviewing these financials. So the, the first one was around expected credit loss, bad debt provisions, and it, there was a particular counterparty which ASIC said had not been pulled out of the general model. This particular counterparty had experienced a significant decline in credit risk and consequently should have had a bigger provision related to it. The next two generally relate to impairment indicators, so making sure that we are focused on those. If we look at provisions and contingent liabilities, Star Entertainment Group particularly is an interesting one because what I often hear is people say to me, yes, we know that you know, we're going to court or we're doing whatever, but we don't know how much the amount is going to be. So we'll just disclose a contingent liability because we haven't got a reliable estimate. The standard itself says that it's deemed to be quite rare that you do not have a reliable estimate. Star Entertainment Group, as many of you may be aware, are currently being pursued by Austrac for a breach of anti-money laundering legislation. And ASIC came in and said, probably it's gonna be a fine here, probably need to do something in your financial statements. So there is quite a long note that's included in the Star financial statements, which again, quite interesting reading. They have given a big explanation of what Austrac's previous fines have been to different entities and have now recorded a provision of $150 million with a very big statement at the bottom that says what actually happens could be very materially different from this amount, but we're putting something in there. So it's a great lesson and, and will certainly be something that I keep throwing out every time people say to me, we can't put a provision in, we don't know how much it's going to be because the a best estimate is as best as we can get. And I expect that provision will keep changing, but that's where we're sitting on. From a revenue perspective, I am surprised that there isn't more restatements in respect of revenue because certainly I am still getting a huge number of questions on revenue. And interestingly, most of the questions arise when people change jobs. 
and I get calls from somebody who says, just started this job as the new CFO, and I'm looking at the revenue recognition methodology, and I just don't think it's right. I don't think it's in compliance with the standard. I don't think they've actually done the work to transition to SSB 15. And in the vast majority of cases, they're right. It is not in compliance with the standards. So given that we don't have a massive number of new standards to think about, great opportunity to look at your revenue recognition policy, look at your methodology, and are we complying with 15? The last one is an if is a listed entity. It's if there you are disclosing any non-IFRA measures. So just a reminder that there is a regulatory guide on that. If you are disclosing any numbers and they're not in compliance with the standards, you have to reconcile them. You have to give more disclosures around that. Again, just pause for a second just to see if there's any comments or questions on any of those. Okay, so now we hit the really depressing section, but then we'll come back out of it and finish on the different section. We are currently in a perfect storm at the moment. Pretty much nothing on that slide is positive, except possibly the one in the bottom right corner, where we have more flexible working arrangements, which you know is generally quite positive. Otherwise, pretty much nothing else is good in respect of here. We are in an environment that is not great from an economic sense, and I will talk more around rising inflation and interest rates and the impact of that. If we look at some of these areas, wages under payment, the last two days, there has been different entities who have been pinged for wages under payment, and it seems to be almost every week we get another one. Interestingly, the one that came out the day before yesterday was to do with long service leave, and it was an error in the accounting system that they had underpaid long service leave. Yesterday, I think it was BHP who've just come out and said that there are however many millions of underpayments of their staff. These are affecting all sizes of organisations. So if you are in a position that you are paying under an award system or you have a number of different casual staff, have you actually checked that it is appropriate what you're paying? Have you actually done a real payroll audit on this? You do not want your names in lights to say that you are underpaying your staff. So very big risk at the minute. You are exposed to fines if you're found. Have you actually done the work to look at that? Supply chain challenges. We are in a situation where during COVID, we had global supply chain challenges and, and everyone was talking about supply chain that they never even thought about it before. Certain things are starting to improve. So freight charges went through the roof during COVID. They've now started to drop and that's great news. However, because they've started to drop, what we are seeing is certain shipping companies are diverting to more profitable areas such as Europe. I had somebody yesterday and he said to me, you know, how accurate is your information? Because he said, I think our lead times are pretty much the same as pre-COVID. And I said, well, what I'm hearing in that respect is generally in order to get that, you are but purchasing in much bigger quantities. And he said, yeah, that's exactly where we are. So that's what we're having to do in order to get the ships to come to us to make it profitable. We're having to order bigger quantities which means that we've got more inventory arriving, possibly more than our demand, which leads us on to potentially, we're having net realizable value provisions being put through, we've got things that are obsolete, we're having to discount quite significantly to be able to sell it. So supply chain challenges are still very, very real. It's just, it's not the massive freight charges anymore, it's generally in relation to inventory. I'm not going to talk through any of those. I'm going to talk about geopolitical. I'm going to talk about inflation and interest on the next few slides. But does anyone have any comments on any of these? I don't like the word checklist, but it's actually a great checklist to have a chat with your directors, have a chat with your audit and risk committees around some of these in respect of the specific issues you're facing. So geopolitical risks, never thought that I would end up writing any material that talked about geopolitical risks. The reason that we are doing this in this session is because ASIC, ASIO rather, not ASIC, ASIO have come out and have said that the risk of espionage and foreign interference is now the biggest risk that is being faced by Australia. It is not terrorism, which means that every entity needs to think about what does that mean for them. Which industry are you operating in? Do you have critical infrastructure? Are you a potential target for cyber? Are you a potential target for insider espionage? 
And have we thought about that? Have we thought about it in respect of insurance? Are our directors considering this? One of the reasons that we are deemed to be a bigger target is because we have stuck our head above the trenches and said, hi, we're here, we're capable of building nuclear submarines along with the UK and the US. So consequently, we have become a target on the worldwide stage. The government have said principally it is China, Russia and Iran that they have very much on their radar. So think about what you deal with in respect of those countries. Do you have any reliance on them from a supply chain perspective? And if you do, what happens if the government introduces immediate sanctions to stop dealing in certain aspects with any of those countries? Because we are seeing that the government can move very, very quickly if they want to shut things down. We saw that in respect of the Ukrainian war. So we need to think about those aspects. We also need to think about things like modern slavery. And when I talk about sustainability later, I'm principally talking about green stuff. But sustainability is, is more than that. It's around diversity, it's around modern slavery. We do have now in Australia, entities with revenue greater than $100 million are required to report on modern slavery. That's mandatory. If you are competing in it with an industry or with an entity who has got that revenue and who is disclosing it, and they've got suppliers, they've got customers who are looking at that information and going, that's actually quite useful information. Why doesn't this smaller entity tell me about that? It might be something that almost becomes mandated best practice. So particularly in China, we are hearing stories that are coming out of there around some modern slavery issues. So have you actually done some work around where your supply chain is, who it is, what are the behaviours that we're seeing in any overseas entities around that? Kevin, do you, I'll bring you the mic. Oh. Interesting topic. I was uh, dealing with that the other day. There's a business, small business guide for businesses under 100 million, and there's a policy on the state government website that you can adopt, and okay. they recommend what you do. So it's yeah, it's a bit onerous, but anyway, that's where it's going. New South Wales state. Or New South Wales, Wales state? yeah. So I think it's something, I mean, I don't put tenders in very often for the work that I do, but often with some of the work I do with the government, we, I do have to put in a tender. And I've started to see that I'm being asked more questions around it. Um, you know, I employ my daughter, she books my travel, she's 16, she thinks she's a modern slave, she really isn't. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm being asked questions around sustainability and being asked questions about how do I know that I'm not engaging with any other entity that engages in modern slavery. So we are definitely starting to see um, this is a topic that we'll see much more of. So let's go back to the financial statements. Let's look at inflation and think about what the impact of inflation is on our financials. We're going to work around the circle. This is the third and the last time I will talk about onerous contracts. So as I've mentioned already, if you have locked yourself into any fixed price contracts, we need to make sure that we haven't got onerous contracts. And if we do, we recognise that loss immediately. The next one is in respect of leases. The vast majority of leases that I review have a CPI clause in them. Now, the way that we account for CPI is we don't guess what CPI is going to be. So if I pay $100 on my lease today, I assume that I will pay $100 for the remaining life of the lease. Next year comes around and the CPI clause kicks in and I pay $107. I assume I will pay $107 every year for the remaining life of the lease. What we've done previously, or what people have tried to do previously, is say that CPI is not material, and therefore they're not adjusting it. CPI is probably very material this year, particularly if you've got lots of leases, particularly if you've got long-term leases. So consequently, you need to understand within your lease contracts, do you have CPI clauses, and have you recalculated? You recalculate the lease liability. The balancing figure goes to right if you sat it, which means you will have probably higher interest and higher depreciation that comes through. So we can't ignore CPR clauses in leases. We shouldn't have in the past, but we definitely can't ignore them this time. Useful lives, prices are going up. We purchased an asset that we thought we would hold on to for five years and replace every five years, because that's what we've always done. 
we actually can't afford to replace it because the price has gone up so much. So all of you would have in your financial statements a statement that says, annually, we review the useful lives and the residual value of all our assets and revise if necessary. You don't look at it, you don't revise them. You all have the statement in your financials. We need to look at it this year to just make sure it's still appropriate. And it might actually be beneficial because if you're not going to replace the asset in 18 months when you initially thought, you will actually spread out that depreciation a little bit more. You do need to take into account in your budgets, potentially the extra repairs and maintenance costs because you're using an asset longer than you thought, but something that will need to be considered. Leave. You may or may not be aware, so what the standard says is when you record a leave provision, you should record it at the amount that you expect to pay out. We are seeing that wage increases are still happening. And if you know on the 1st of July that all your staff will get a known pay rise, the provision at 30th of June has to be increased for that pay rise. So therefore, if we're giving some reasonable pay rises, potentially that could be a big uplift on those provisions. We can't ignore any of those. Inventory, we've talked a little bit about supply chain and we've talked about how you might be getting higher inventory in that's possibly exceeding your demand. We also are paying more for that. Now it really depends on what inventory it is. We've all gone to the supermarket, we have to deal with the fact that your milk, your bread, your eggs, your cheese have all gone up in value and we have to just pay it because you know, it's a core item. But if I'm to buy a new pair of shoes or if I was to buy another luxury item, do I have to buy that? Or do I have to, am I waiting until there's a sale that happens? We're seeing massive discounting that's occurring on what's deemed to be luxury items as people are struggling to purchase it. So again, expect to see more NRV provisions. The last one I've just put in as a bit of a catch-all. Is there any other inflation-based clauses in any of your agreements? And what does that mean for your financial statements? Interest rates. Obviously, interest rates are going up as well as inflation. So what does it mean for our debt covenants? Have you got any debt covenants that is linked to, for example, interest cover? Because as you have, have got higher interest expense, ironically, you might breach the bank covenant because the bank's charging you more interest. But if we think about it's not just interest on bank loans, it's interest on leases, and it's unwinding of provisions that we include within those interest expense. So have we focused on that? Again, we've talked about inventory and buying more. And what we've seen as a result of that is entities undertaking more inventory financing, which has often got a higher interest rate. Are we able to make the repayments on the debt that we've got? Um, and what is the implication if we have, if we can? Impairment, I've talked about the fact that interest rates are increasing is an impairment indicator. It is an explicitly stated indicator in 136. So consequently, you're not going to be able to avoid doing your impairment testing at the current year. One of the other indicators is the entity has experienced a negative change in economic conditions, markets, laws, or technology. Again, I think most entities have probably suffered from that as well. So making sure you are thinking about your recoverable amount testing, you can do it now. You don't need to wait till the auditors turn up and start asking you the questions. If you have a long-term provision and you've, un you've discounted that, every year you have to unwind the discount on that provision. As interest rates are higher, you are unwinding a bigger amount. Consequently, you're ending up with bigger provisions, bigger interest expenses. Links back to that debt covenants. Leases, again, every time we talk about leases, we don't change the incremental borrowing rate on a lease until something changes within a lease. We are seeing significant changes to leases because people are reducing floor space, because they're reducing the amount of time they're there, maybe not taking out options. If we change a lease, we are required to change the discount rate. Discount rate will be higher than when we initially booked it. So that means we're discounting more, which means lower liability. Sounds great, less liability. However, what it does mean is higher interest expense. We go back to my first one about debt covenants. You can see why we're really in this perfect storm around this. So just be very aware of that. Other things that we might need to think about. Going concern. We are expecting to see an increased number of entities who have going concern disclosures. 
So you may well have issues with um, key ratios that aren't necessarily going the way you want it to. Those going concern disclosures have to be specific to the entity. They are not boilerplate. They are telling me your plan A and your plan B. Tell me the story of why you think going concern disclosures are appropriate. And talk to your advisors sooner rather than later because this may well have implications for your audit opinion. Adam, did you have any comments on this one? If there are any um, entities out there that thinks you need to have a going concern conversation or, or an issue, we should be doing that now. Should be doing that up front prior to turning up for the year end audit because um, in our experience, it's really important to engage with directors, the CEO, the CFO early and have these discussions rather than a surprise. Uh, because it, it can impact a number of stakeholders. And that's not saying that there will be a going concern, emphasis of matter um, in the audit opinion, but let's just have the conversation, I think. Fantastic. If we look at our assumptions, our judgments and our estimates, the only thing we do know about them is they will not be the same as last year because we are not in the same economic climate, we're not in the same um, situation that we were. So think about all of those assumptions, judgments and estimates you put in your financial statements and make sure that you have supportable numbers, that you actually have considered them, what are they going to be for the current year. The reason I put share-based payments in is because I've had a number of entities who have not been performing very well. Consequently, that means that the hurdles in the share-based payment program is not going to be met. So what they say is, let's just cancel it because it saves that expense that we keep charging. It's the worst thing that you can do. If you cancel a share-based payment program, what that actually means is you are accelerating the, fair, the grant date fair value. Doesn't mean you can stop recording that expense. So consequently, if you do have these share-based payment programs, either keep them running or cancel it, but issue a replacement program immediately, because at least then you're not throwing through a massive acceleration of expenses, um, which is often not the outcome that entities want, but they don't think of the accounting when they do these programs. Last one, events after the reporting period. So I gave you some time to be thinking about how you're gonna collect that information. It, does, it is important that you think about things specific to your entity, but also what is happening in the Australian context and in the global macroeconomic sense. Because little things that happen somewhere else, the whole butterfly wing flapping, has impacts over here within Australia. So making sure we're identifying those. Questions or comments on any of that? Said it wasn't an overly cheery session, um, but something that we absolutely need to think about. All right, so let's move on to our last session, which is sustainability. And what I'm really gonna focus on is, is the green element of sustainability. In particularly, around some things, greenwashing that we're seeing the regulators are doing. So what is greenwashing and why do we care? It is absolutely the biggest focus of a number of regulators at the moment. Um, whether it's the trendy thing, um, because sustainability, everybody's talking about it, not sure. But we're definitely seeing constant media attention around this. If we think about what greenwashing actually is, there is no universally accepted definition. So I've put two definitions up there. The interesting thing, I think, is in the asset definition in that bullet point. Greenwashing is not limited to environmental claims, but extends to misleading ethical propositions. So if you're trying to make out that you're making the world a better place and you can't support that statement, you're probably going to be done for greenwashing. And there is a number of entities looking at this pretty much everywhere that you put out any information. So we're not just talking in your annual reports, we're talking about any information that you put out to the public. Your auditors have to read the information that's in the annual report. They don't audit it, they read it to see whether it is inconsistent with any other information. So if you start making some wild and wonderful statements about how you're making the world a better place, they probably will ask the question, can you support it? They're not going to audit it. That is not their role. Probably don't even want to see the support that you've got for that. But asking the question to make sure that every statement you make is supportable is really important. Making sure that your marketing people are very aware that any statement they put out is open for scrutiny and has to be supportable. 
anything in this green space is being challenged. So we'll see some impacts of that going forward. If we link it back to financial statements, the term climate change does not appear in the counting standards at all, but neither did the term COVID. Yet we all dealt with COVID. We all dealt with the fact that we had additional disclosures. We had to change our inputs. We had to change our assumptions. Our standards are principles based. And the intention is that they are future proofed, that effectively they will consider risks that we face, whatever that risk might be. So when you're looking through the standards and say it doesn't require us to disclose anything about this, that's why, because you can't cover every single scenario. We will talk a little bit later on about some new standards that are coming, but we still have to consider it at the moment. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. This is a slide that, or a diagram that I picked from a document that was put out by the Accounting Standards Board and the Auditing Standards Board a couple of years ago. And it's specifically about climate risk, but it's equally applicable to any other risk that we face. So it talks again about investors, but if you just use the term primary users, if you do not have investors. So the first question that we need to ask when we're thinking about any of this information is would the user of the accounts expect to see something in our financial statements about climate? Are we operating in an industry that prima facie is not necessarily doing great things in the environmental space? Are all our competitors talking about what they're doing in relation to climate related <coughs> risks and therefore our users would expect to see that? As you can see, depending on our answers to that question and the next question, in most situations they would expect to be some disclosures or at least we think about it in respect of the inputs and assumptions that we've got. I said that there's nothing in the standards. However, I've just put on here some specific standards where your inputs, your judgments and your assumptions might actually be affected. So if we take things like, I'm not going to talk through all of them, but if we look at R&D expenditure, depending on what space you are operating in, you may well be having to spend a significant amount of money to try and investigate a more environmentally friendly way of doing whatever you are doing. Now, regardless of what happens for R&D tax offsets, it may be that you have to expense it all for accounting purposes. So are you explaining that to the users? Because effectively, you're trying to future-proof your organization. We are seeing useful lives having to alter. We've just talked about how useful lives might be extended because you can't afford a different asset. Useful lives might also be shorter because the current assets that you have are not the greenest products that you might have. And therefore, you might have to get rid of them earlier than you thought. We are seeing financial institutions offer products that are the interest rate is linked to your green credentials. The greener you are, the lower the interest rate that you pay. So how are you monitoring that? How are you actually tracking that? Adam, did you want to talk about uh, impact? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, I've been getting some questions about this over the last few months, and I didn't know a lot about it, to be fair. Um, and as part of that process, uh, we've just recently started a, a collaboration with a company in Singapore who, um, they're a, a worldwide company who have a software program that measures impact of ESG. And um, they've, they were born out of the uh, academia um, area through the university sector and um, as part of that software program, um, they, they document impact across all ESG areas and allows the evidence base to be supported in relation to the disclosures. And the evidence base um, is peer reviewed by other academics or it could be supported by other experts because as finance professionals in the room, we're not scientists. We're not people who have the skills to be able to adequately say that this stuff is what it is because we that's not us. So um, if your clients are asking you questions about that or clients in the room who are thinking about that, um, it's really important to understand the evidence base and um, have discussions with us about um, your financial report. Thanks, Adam. 
So let's keep going through and seeing what we're seeing in this space. And I guess one of my favorite comments in relation to this is that people don't expect perfection in this space. What they do expect is honesty. And talking about transparency and talking about making sure that what we say is supportable. So we have an entity that it was an airport, disclosed that they were net zero. Fantastic, amazing achievement. They also disclosed that they had not considered planes flying in and out of the airport and the traffic, uh, the um, cost of people coming in and out of the airport so again they were transparent they were honest probably not really what people think for an airport but it's making sure we very clearly disclose what we mean when we're making the statements when we think about the inputs and the assumptions two oil and gas entities one has assumed a business as usual price and that demand will stay exactly the same based on those assumptions they did not have any impairment the other entity assumed that there would be a decline given the current environment. Given that decline that they assumed, they ended up with an impairment. Prima facie, you look and you say the first entity is performing better. But are their inputs and assumptions appropriate given where the world is going in respect to sustainability? So thinking about very clearly disclosing what we are doing in this space and the inputs, the assumptions, really, really important. So let's have a look at what ASIC have been up to. ASIC have started issuing infringement notices. Now, an infringement notice is effectively like a fine, and they're also always very clear when they issue an infringement notice that says payment of an infringement notice is not an admission of guilt. Now, I guess there's two ways to think about this. You can think, well, why would anyone pay an infringement notice if they weren't guilty? The other hand is when we see some of the size of these fines, it is probably easier to pay the fine than to try and fight it and incur however many hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees. These entities are not necessarily in industries that you guys are in, but it's really important to see some great examples of when we talk about greenwashing what we actually mean. These two entities are both energy companies and effectively they did very similar things. They were both setting up new plants and they made comments that those plants would be net zero or carbon neutral. ASIC did some investigation and did not believe that the entities could support that. Consequently, has issued infringement notices to them. Now, these were both commented in ASX announcements, so it was not in their annual report, but it was something that went out to the market. The next three are in relation to financial institutions. And effectively, the first two are around different products that were being offered. And it was where the headline did not match necessarily the fine print. So for example, if we take the first one, Vanguard, their headline was effectively, tobacco is bad. Because they said, we will not invest in any company involved in significant tobacco manufacture. The fine print, however, said we're okay with anybody who sells tobacco. So ASIC are very much looking and saying if you have a headline of A, you can't have B in the fine print. It has to be very clear. Very similar to the next one, around big headline about all of the different types of entities that they were not going to invest in. When ASIC looked at their investment management agreement, said it's too, too broad. What you've said up there is not what's being reflected down. The interesting thing about the last one is where that information was. It was on their Facebook account. So we generally think about, we talk about greenwashing, we think about what do we have in the annual report, what do we have in the ASX announcements, what do we have on the website. Wherever you put public information out there, it is very much there for the public to comment on and for any regulator to go after you. So be very, very cautious about what you are saying and have you got that support. So you might be looking and going, these infringement notices, the amounts aren't huge. You know, okay, what's the big deal? These entities are big entities. ASIC then up the game and they have launched their first court proceedings in relation to greenwashing. Mercer Superannuation, major organisation within Australia, they launched an investment product that was called the Sustainable Plus Investment Product. For members who are deeply committed to sustainability, and it excludes investments in companies involved in carbon intensive fossil fuels, doesn't involve in alcohol production and gambling. When ASIC looked at who the investments were actually in, you can see that there is a number of investments in those companies where they explicitly stated they were not investing. 
Everybody is watching with bated breath to see what happens in this court case. If Mercer are found guilty, the fines will be way more significant than those infringement notices that we've just seen. So very much looking at the profile of these, very high. The ACCC then decided they would get in on the action. So they've approached it slightly differently. The ACCC have much bigger teeth than ASIC. So consequently, any action that comes from these, we're expecting the numbers to be much bigger. They reviewed 247 entities, and they said that more than one in two of them, the number was 57% of them, are making dubious claims about their environmental or sustainability practices. And consequently, what the ACCC have said is we are going to do more investigations. Now, the ACCC have approached it quite differently. They haven't named those 247 companies. They haven't named the 57% of them who they believe have got dubious practices. They've just said they're investigating. My favourite bit about the media release from the ACCC is these two bottom lines. We are encouraging any businesses to come forward who believe they have made misleading or false marketing claims. And if you do come forward, we will be much more lenient on you than if we find you. So consequently, that's effectively saying, if anyone's aware, you, we may not have even looked at you at that 247, but please come forward so it saves us doing that work on that. So let's see what happens out of this. Again, I expect that we will see some much bigger fines in relation to this. Now, you may be listening and thinking, well, I'm not governed by ASIC, I'm not governed by the ACCC, they're probably not gonna come after me. Just think about there is often, depending on the industry you are in, particularly if you're in the public sector, there is somebody who is monitoring you who is way worse than either of these, and that's the media. Because in the public sector, if the media get hold of any of these dubious claims in the public sector, they will be all over it. So regardless of who is governing you, regardless of the type of entity, just be aware of what you are actually putting out there. The issue that we're seeing with a lot of these greenwashing is ground. People are now getting worried about what they're seeing, and we're seeing this term called green hushing, which means people are getting so scared of what they're seeing because of all of these people that are after them that we're not actually seeing anything, and we're withdrawing things that we've actually said. So we've got some recent examples in the AFR around this. So we have to hit balance. We can't say too much that's not true, and we can't say nothing because the investors have said they want some information. Which means we need to have some sort of framework. The International Sustainability Standards Board was set up in late 2021 to issue a global suite of standards. It is a sister body to the International Accounting Standards Board. Within this month, we will have the first two standards that are issued by that board. They will not be issued mandatorily within Australia because they have no jurisdictional right over Australia. So exactly the same as what we see with the international standards. They will be issuing standards and the Australian government, whether that is the SSB who currently have carriage on this, or Treasury, will decide what our standards framework will look like in Australia. At every SSB meeting, they have a huge number of updates around what everybody who has issued standards is currently doing and where the current state of play is. I can stand here today and tell you that at this point in time, there is no mandatory climate reporting in the financial statements. I think next year, whoever is standing here will not be able to make that same comment. They won't necessarily be effective yet, but there will be some mandatory standards that are in play. We don't at this point know who they will be for. We don't know when it will be effective, but it is moving incredibly quickly. So I would encourage anyone who's interested in this space. There's a research report that's just come out looking at some ASX entities and seeing what they have disclosed. New Zealand, slightly ahead of us, they've already issued three climate related disclosures that become effective for certain entities from 31st of March, 2024. Whoever is making the decision in Australia will look to New Zealand, as well as looking at the ISSB standards. We also have a number of other standards. I don't think they'll be written from scratch, the Australian standards. We will definitely piggyback off some other standards. We just at this stage don't know what that will look like. That's it for me. Went one minute over today. <laughs> Any final questions or comments? Uh, I'd just like to introduce 
Bala Pillay and um, Vimal sitting up in the back table. Uh, I've been sort of collaborating with Bala for probably the last six months now and, and his firm uh, HLB Ham. So uh, HLB Ham are the, um, what's known as the International Centre of Excellence for Technology uh, for the HLB International Network, which we are a part of. So um, as part of that process, um, Buller and his team um, have uh, specialised in, in digital transformation and in particular robotics process automation. Uh, and we've been working with Bala on um, creating some bots and we're about to roll that out, our first bot, which is pretty exciting. And I can show you, uh, we've got some videos there around what that looks like. Um, so yeah, um, we uh, enjoy working with Bala and um, collaborating with his team as, as we learn the technology journey. And um, it's great to have his expertise. So uh, let's welcome Bala. Thank you, Adam. Uh, first, uh, I would like to say Tiana for giving us the opportunity. Okay, thank. Good morning, everybody. Uh, directly going inside of our agenda, I speak a little bit about what is HLB Hand and what are the service they do, what professional service we do in the technology space, and how HF, HLB and Tiana can help you. Okay, we have done a collaboration six months back. We are from Dubai. Uh, we, we have uh, 12 offices in three countries, 350 employees, 2,000 clients, and we, we rank seventh uh, in, in UAE. Uh, we do service all Middle East. Uh, uh, we do all the service, what TNR does, but we, we are most focused on the technology side, my team, and uh, in Dubai, back in India too. We have a big uh, team in India with uh, 75 employees in technology space. We do all the services, ERP implementation, biz, uh, digital transformation, business consulting, uh, cyber security, and digital platform, customized digital platform for the businesses. So we cover all the industries from manufacturing sectors to distribution sectors to mining, utilities, staffing, defense sector, so all these sectors we work, both on the implementation side, even the consulting side too. So when I say consulting, we do consulting in the digital, digital transformations, and uh, at the same time, implementing the digital transformations. So I, I just want to go more deep inside what is digital. So everybody speaks about digital transformations. What is digital transformation? Digital transformation is something on top of your existing systems which you use, either it's an SAP, Info, Zero, Myobi. So all this, on top of that, we build a digital transformation that is related to uh, robotics, or it is machine learnings or a big data integration with third party applications. If you go that deep more inside that, that is intelligently connecting people, things and businesses. So, so these are all the digital transformations happens today on top of your existing systems, okay? Either you use, uh, uh, as I said, that zero, okay? Which gets integrated with the government portals or gets integrated with any other third party application. So we use this kind of, these technologies to integrate with all your third parties. Like example, when I say uh, payment gateway, okay? That has to be integrated with your, uh, with your bankings. Okay, so we do integrations and we help on uh, on, the, on the integrations and do implementation on that. The most important thing which is which happening in today's world is bots. Okay, so what is bot? Anything which is uh, uh, repetitive work you do in 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 today's world. So this is what is happening in today's world. Okay, in two thousand we were doing an IT transformations everybody was started using computers okay in 2010 it is a digital transformations everybody started using mobile and like social medias all connecting to the world but in today's world it is workforce transformations what is workforce transformation means 
there is a huge shortage of skill set labors globally. So how to overcome that short shortage is only with the technology. If you implement the technology, you can overcome of, of workforce shortage. At the same time, you're, you're par with your competitors who are implementing technology. So what is technology here is automation, that is process automations and AI technology. Okay, going more deep inside that, what, what is the journey we were doing before? Your past, that is micros and uh, writing BPMs, with the investment, you have to do huge amount of investment, both about the time and money. Okay, and ROI used to take nearly about six to eight months. But with today's technology, that is using RPA, or AI technology or ML technology, the ROI is, depending upon the requirements, sometimes the ROI is within three days, okay, with no code, low code uh, platforms. Uh, coming to that more detail, these are the, these are the modules uh, you, we, we have done on our automations. At the same time, the technology implementation, both on the data warehousing, AI technology, ML technologies, all this comes inside. So if you see that we have covered all the areas of the businesses, from accounting to real estate, project management, inventory, sales and distribution, manufacturing, logistic, HCM, all the areas. And in that, the sub-modules are there. You can see all the sub-modules which is being implemented here. And about that, this enterprise add-on is specialized verticals. Like example, if you're a distribution company, you may be required in warehouse. If, you, if you're using some uh, platform that is mail ITs, bots, workflows, this is all specialized vertical specific industry requirement. So going more inside that, this is the future. All AI, ML, API, next generation mobility, drones, mixed reality, safety and ent ent exit. The most, the today's topics, the most we will be focusing on is RPA. What is RPA? Anything which is you are doing repeatedly in your day-to-day -day activity, and that has to be automated. Okay, that is called RPA, robotic process automation, with the help of OCR. That is called optical character recognition. On top of that, we will be implementing the machine learnings and artificial intelligence. This is what you do in your day-to-day -day activity invoice processing you know, on, on the top on the top you will be doing this is the manual process you do but on the bottom this is where the automation comes inside the picture so what do you do I, i'll take an example of accounts payable what is accounts payable how, how the accounts payable st process starts okay you may be having a vendor like example i take a 50 vendor that all 50 vendors may be sending an invoice to you on a, on a, on a monthly basis or on a, on, a, on a weekly basis. All these 50 uh, vendors may be having an invoice in different, different formats. It comes to your email. Someone reads that particular email, open that PDF, see that PDF, the header line and the line item. Someone has to read that and enter into your accounting or an ERP system. Okay, he has to log in inside the zero example I'll take a zero he goes to the uh, AP invoice module open the AP invoice put the header then the line item if the line item is more than uh, 50 line items okay a thumb rule says that roughly around 50 to 20 minutes maybe more than that it all depends upon the invoice which comes in the hand okay so if you say that this process takes 50 to 20 minutes but if you implement RPA, that is robot, robotic process automation, that whole process will go in seconds or maximum one minute. Okay, so if in a day you get roughly around 15 to 20 invoices in your organization, okay, that is that means 15 into 20 invoices. So just imagine how much time it takes. So if you want to fast track the whole process, because that is a repetitive process. If you want to fast track the whole process, we implement, with the help of TNI, we implement the RPA. That whole 15 into 20, the whole process goes into 5 to 10 minutes max. And the most important thing is that some, we are human. Okay, we make error. 
while doing a data entry job, we miss error. And that error sometimes we, we identify after five days or 10 days, maybe maybe in the one then, while doing the process. Okay. So with the help of RPA, we have taken an example only for the HR processes. Okay. So if you can see that from employer onboarding to attendance to expense management to staff management to job requisition to time and expense, all these areas has been automated with the help of RPA. Huge amount of time has been saved. One of the implementation we have done in a government sector, okay, that is that was the process from sales code to creating a PO. The whole process was taking for one PO entry with 1,500 line items was taking roughly around six hours. We done it in a 30 minutes. There might be hundreds of purchase related documents such as purchase requests, purchase invoices, purchase orders, etc. processed in a company every month and all these entries should be ultimately entered in an ERP system like SAP B1 or Sage X3 manually one by one. This process takes time and also can relate to manual errors creeping in. These document sources can be email or watch folders which can scan 24-7. The pre-programmed bots will pick it from the inbox or folder and input it into the OCR system. There will be an option to upload the documents manually to the OCR system as well. The next step is automating purchase related document scanning, document data extraction, and classification. It provides recognition of data on scanned paper or PDF documents. The application reads the data from the document image based on predefined templates. The application then checks the extracted data against field types and checksums and validates line items. There is also an option to manually validate and cross-verify the data. Once extracted, the data can be fed to an endpoint such as document management systems, popular ERP software platforms, CRM solutions like HubSpot or Zoho, an accounting system, or integrated data that can be exported to any database or document format. In ERP solutions like Sage X3 or SAP B1, the entire purchase related data entry process can be automated with the help of bots, eliminating any data entry errors through this process, thereby increasing your productivity by many folds. The whole application can be seamlessly integrated with third party apps like DigiSigner for improving the overall security. So here what we, you, you can see that how the whole process is getting automated about the, from the sales order to purchase order, even your DG signage, you may be doing lots of, yeah, yes sir. What's the um, error rate with, with the optical recognition? What's the error rate with the optical recognition? Because typically that can be, that can fall down there sometimes when, they, when it's reading the invoice. Yeah, so what happened? So what happened here is that we, we, when we do an OCR, okay, we have to teach the OCR applications at least one or two times. So once the OCR application is being, we teach them, the next time you put that particular document, automatically it extracts all the information. And we always say that uh, even the technology comes inside the picture, someone has to review the data. If, if there are 10 people who is doing the activity, the, we, we, we can say that one person has to review the data before it goes to the system and finally it hits your ledger. So, hope I have answered your question. So what we have done is that your digital signature, the digital signature, what you do is that someone has to extract the information from the, from the, from the, from the ERP systems Okay, either in a PDF and you have to put that PDF inside the digital signature and after the whole workflow starts. But what we have done it here, even ever in internal process, we have integrated directly through an ERP. Once it clicks the button save, the whole digital signature starts. Once the signature happens, the final document goes to the, uh, uh, to the client and it stores it to in, inside your document management system for your future reference. Data analytics. We do 
a huge uh, data warehousing and data analytics like visualizations. If you see here, these are these are the few reports which we created internally at the same time for the clients. And when you see this kind of data, okay, this is a dynamic dashboard. You can drill down to the transactions level. So, so what happens here is that it makes your life easy. First thing is that you don't have to ask the data from your employer or from the clients. Okay, you get the data information on the dashboard every morning. If you want to drill down the information, you just have to drill down on that particular graph and it goes to the transactions level. So if you see here, so from a supplier aging to the customer aging to the transit, so the balance is everything comes inside 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 one dashboard. And if you drill down that information, it goes to the transactions level and you can take the decisions according to that. So in today's world, this is very important. So now most of the people who, who uh, they use Excel, they extract the information from the from the ERP system or an accounting system, and they do all the manipulation inside the Excel sheet, and then it goes to the uh, to the management or to the client. But here. They, they don't have to do, you don't have to ask anybody. You just click a button, you get all the information in your dashboard, and, and you can take your strategy decisions. And the most important thing is that where this all information is coming from, we have to build a dashboard. Data warehousing, sorry. So where this data warehousing, if you have, if you're using a multiple sy systems, like if, a, if, if a company is in logistic, they, they get lots of information from the third party applications, like rate. Okay, so if we, we what we do is that, uh, we extract that particular information, store it into a database, and put it into a visualized format. Okay. Digital platforms. What we do in digital platforms, it is if if the industry is very specific, they don't have any application inside the mar outside the market. We build an application for them. Okay, if integrating with all the third parties. And this is one of the examples which we do. It's procurement that is called P to P procure to pay. The whole informations, okay. Normally, ERP doesn't has these whole informations. So what we have done, we have developed a platform where all the information from your tendering process to your contract process, supplier portal, all these informations comes into this platform platforms and it gets integrated with your ERP systems. So like, I'll, I'll take an example of contract. Like you, you may be having a multiple contracts related to your suppliers, okay? And that has to be managed inside the system with all the alerts and approvals. So all this can be done in a P2P systems. At the same time, the supplier portal, Okay, you don't have to give the information to, to supplier through an email or a WhatsApp or anything. They just have an access of the supplier portal and all the information related to the suppliers will be there. Okay, some RFPs or anything you release, just supplier has to enter inside the portal access and they get all the information. At the same time, you uh, every year you, you may be asking lots of documents related to the supplier like trade license and all other government documents. You don't have to ask that. They will just get an alert. They just go inside the supplier portal, update all the information, and that gets integrated with your ERP system. Okay, I, I'll show you some videos, which uh, Okay, you want a case of this? So um, we've got some of my team here. I'm looking at Ankush, Cooper, where are you guys? Just here. So um, we use a, a audit software platform called Caseware. So I know that there's a few people in the room who are familiar with that. Um, let's say you're new to the job and you're um, creating a Caseware file. You don't know much about it, it probably takes half an hour, I guess. Um, so what this does is automatically create the file and roll forward all the information from last year's file into the, the new file in about, how long, Bob? Three minutes? Uh, maximum three minutes. So what do you see? Is, is, is that it can get five minutes? 
is an engagement file and just just reading an engagement file you can just see that on the corner the bot started running so all the information from the engagement file and the information stored in a particular folder start extracting and it start creating a new file for you for the current year taking your next year file so you can see here is the bot create a new file for the next year So you can see on the board, on the corner, everything board is doing, nothing we are doing it. It's so fast, you know, the human and uh, I can't see, we have just delayed the whole uh, video. So once the whole process is completed, how, how uh, the end user will get an email that the, the whole process has been completed with this particular file and it creates a small uh, summary of the uh, of the whole process and send it to your email so you just get an output you know what input you have given you just you get directly get an output of the file okay and the alert has been sent it uh, through email even sometimes uh, we, we are doing uh, lots of uh, R&D on chat GPT I'll give more information once the whole video is been completed. So you can see that the bot is copying the component from the previous and synchronizing the file. So uh, we have implemented this process in, in internally. We have uh, 800 plus auditing customers uh, in, in Middle East. And this process was taking a huge amount of time. You can if just imagine 800 clients, uh, a thumb rule says that roughly around 17 to 18 minutes per per customers, so it was taking huge. So what we have done, we have implemented an automations in our internal processes, and this is this is what they are doing. And one person is just reviewing everything. The whole data is reviewed by one person for the 800 customers. So we we, we shared a good amount of millions of money in this in this area. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, Uh, this is one of the import, one of the big process which we have uh, done and saved huge amount of money for our customer. Uh, it's it's a customer called Kalyan Jewelers. Uh, if any Indian stays uh, knows this, uh, Kalyan Jewelers is a big uh, jewelry uh, company global, uh, and they have a big uh, outlets in, in in UAE. They have something around eighteen outlets. In a day, 4,000 transactions gets gets executed with a credit card, and the next day, all this credit card transaction has to be has to be reconciled with their POS systems. So one bank, they have eight banks. Okay, one bank takes roughly around uh, 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 45 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes to reconcile. We did this process, and we did this in 80 seconds. So here I have taken an example of four banks. A bot started running. That's an input file from all the banks. Uh, uh, you can see that as a four. You can see all these four banks. These are the four banks. That is Rag Bank, Mashrik Bank, Networking, and other one bank. Uh, so if you see that, so these are the new status. So this is an input file. So you can see the bot is reading the configuration file. This is the output we get from the rag bank. Okay, this is what we do. All the comparisons like uh, commissions, discounts, all this information comes from the bank, and we segregate that in an Excel sheet. And the reconciliation output start from your, your credit sums, all this information. If there is any exceptions, they are not able to reconcile. Only that particular information goes to uh, end users as an email. So you can see the Mashrik Bank, the next bank started. So what is happening here? You can see here the completed. The first two banks has been completed. 
Okay, the status gets updated automatically with the logics. And this status, we send as an email that all this back has been reconciliation and there is no exception. If there is exception, we give a status as a as an end so that, yeah, some transaction has been not uh, reconciled with the bank and the POS system. So you can see that the PyLabs processing the reconciliations. Oh, all the four banks has been completed. This we have, the, the whole video I have delayed it, but if, 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 if the bot run in an actual speed, you will not see what is going on here. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'll give more information what now this robot is doing is that uh, in UAE from the central bank, uh, that there is a per for, for all the auditing firm has to follow, and even the company has to follow the current exchange rate, which is published in central bank, not from any other website. You have to get the detail. So what happens every day, some person has to go to the central bank, extract the data of the, of the exchange rate, and that has to be updated to an ERP system. I'm not showing here the ERP systems because it's a it's a privacy here, but I will show how it is getting updated inside the Excel, and that Excel gets integrated with the with the ERP system. It was taking a huge amount of time, and most important thing is that the whole updation happens after the working hours. At six o'clock, this updation happens. Someone has to extract the data and update the system before the next day the transactions start entering inside the system. So uh, uh, roughly around it was taking a hour job. Uh, we did it in a 50 second. So if you see here, uh, it's a little bit slow. Uh, you can see here the we, we we are running a board once again. So once once the board starts running, it it goes to the website. Okay, yeah, it's a, you can see a top yeah, a central bank's website. This is an exchange rate which is coming. This is an output file which is uh, we go for which date this particular exchange rate we require. It goes to that particular exchange rate, extract the data, and update the Excel sheet. And we we have created the output in an XML file too. XML file is a uh, is a file which is used for all the integration purposes. Okay for any SAP, SAP ERP, or Info, or Oracle, or Microsoft Dynamic, even Zero can use Excel, XML output for their integrations. So once it is integrated, you can see that the Excel sheet is getting updated continuously with all the data. We have written in such a way, logic in that Saturday, Sunday, the currency is not, get, it is not getting updated. Okay, If you're doing any transaction on Saturday, it will take the Friday currency rate. So I'll just forward this little bit. So you can see that this is an XML format, which gets integrated with all the ERP systems or any other system. It's not only ERP systems. If you want this information to any other system, we can push that system through an API or any, any other platform like staging table. Okay. Yeah. So when I look at that, I think about um, treasury management. So um, daily market prices, bank bill swap rates, I think about clients in the commodity sector, uh, world sugar prices, whatever it might be, where someone is manually going to a website on a daily basis to extract information to update as part of a manual process internally. That would be pretty common. All this is is logic. It's not hard, it's just, uh, getting a, a bot in place to do the manual clicking that someone would do on a daily basis. And um, the, the question came up yesterday about, okay, so I'm going onto a website, I log in, and then the traffic lights come up, and there's a, a grid that says, click on the, the things that you know are a traffic light. The bot is trained to actually click on the right boxes. Seriously. And then what about MFA? there's a solution for MFA as well. So when Elon Musk says that AI is going to kill us all, I genuinely believe that's a possibility after seeing that.
when you say a bot, are you how are they stored and do they can they run automatically, for example? So you have a storage of the things that you want to run and can they run automatically? So say for example if someone wanted to do this every day, they could just so the, the bot's developed and it's scheduled for a time. Yeah. So it'll just automatically run at 4 a.m. or when, whenever you schedule it for. Um, and you need a, so this is developed in a software package called Automate Anywhere. And uh, it's what the big four use. Okay, so there's about three different, well, there's a few different ones. There's Automate Anywhere, there's UiPath, yeah, Blue Prism. Um, Automate Anywhere is the best one. Uh, UI paths probably a little bit easier to understand and and um, get some ground running, but I think the results speak for themselves. I'll just show you one of the application which we have integrated. How you use zero in your uh, in your world? That is Australia and New Zealand. Zero is not in our country in UAE. Uh, we have QuickBooks, uh, Sage, small applications. So one of the integration we do accounting outsourcing. So we do lots of data entry job. We get lots of information from the client. Okay, either in PDF or Excel or Word. So we, we used to spend a huge amount of time doing a data entry. So one of the process we have automated is get we get information in PDF and Excel from the client. We do OCR systems and that gets integrated inside the QuickBook. And the final results gets like we just get an email that the whole transaction has been completed. Someone go and review inside the systems and get just click one button, the whole posting happens to the JV level. So these are information, so you can see that, that uh, we get this information in Excel. And uh, this information is now, now, so nothing has been completed in this particular folder. So what we do, we go inside the QuickBooks. So you can see that on the right hand side, the bot is doing this activity, not, not human anymore. Okay, so it creates new and the new build transaction and to start happens inside the system. Okay, so when the whole process is getting completed, so one by one, the transaction, the header gets created, the line item gets created, okay? So once the whole transaction is completed, the, the status gets, uh, the file goes to the complete folder, so you have an information. At the same time, the whole file gets emailed to a particular uh, user ID, that is end user, and she can just, or she or he can go just inside the system and just click, just review and click it, and it hits the GV. See here, so whole the line item is getting updated now. So what is what is what is important here is that what will never fail. If it fails, something goes wrong in the in network, okay, or the internet. If it fails, it gives the exact time uh, where the bot has been failed, and it will give an information to you that what has been updated inside the system and what has not been updated and where the bot has been stopped. Okay, so you have all the information. So the so most important thing is that all the banking sectors. Now, if you see that all the banking sectors are using automation. So I, I'll give a very good example. If you know a bank called DSB. It's a Singapore bank, okay? They don't have branch. If, they, if you go to their branch, only two people will be standing for you, and they will be guiding you once again, use your mobile and do all the processes. They will not say, myself, I'll do the processes, no. They will teach you how to do the processes. So that level of automation is going on around the world. The FinTech is the one where like most of the automation is happening. The second one is coming to the service industry and the third one is going in manufacturing industry. If you see all the manufacturing area, if you go to their factory, lots of automation is happening in that area. Now, yeah, I'll show the procurement one. So this is not an actual system. We have done for UAE, Sheikh, uh, King. Uh, 
Uh, he has a private office. Lots of sales order gets updated inside the system. So that's why I think this, just for your information, this is that's the system which you're using is a dummy area. So they use Sage X3, okay, and they get lots of information like that. You can see that the two Excel sheet represents these are Sage X3 applications they use, and all the data entry goes inside the system automatically. So you can see on the right hand side the board is running. There's a different application we use internally, and the sales order getting created inside the system. No human. So they get roughly around. There are other processes which we are doing automation. They get roughly around 900 transaction. Uh, in, in one week and it was taking a huge amount of time to do a data entry and we have done an automation. The final, the final data goes to the approvals. Once the approval is done, once again the bot comes inside the system and post the transaction as a JV and hit the GL level. So this is done. And last one I would like to show you is Flower. Once again, uh, we, we are not showing the actual system. We have built a platform here to just to show how the whole process happens. This is a Flur, one of the big multinational company with billion dollars in revenue. And uh, they do business in uh, UAE. And there is a law in UAE that each and every tra transaction you do after uh, outside the free zone that has to be updated inside the customs portal. And uh, they recently got, when they were liquidating one of their entity, they recently got $45 million fine because they were not able to do the transaction properly. So we are, with the help of automation, we are doing all the transactions for them. So what we are doing, so we are doing uh, uh, from SAP, okay, we extract the data, we extract that PDF, and we go to the government portal where they, they have to upload all the information to that particular transactions with all the attachment of the document. So, so you can see here, this is the transactions level, line item level. So what we have done, so we, we, we extract the data, the line level data, this is, a, this is a line level, we go inside the government portal. So we find out that particular header as a transaction so this all automation is doing this. So at the header level, we search the set the transactions, and line level we upload the documents. So once this document has been uploaded in the government portal, the government review this document. If any of the document is getting rejected, we once again take the rejection information and update to the. ERP system that this particular document has been rejected by the government. If it is approved, the status comes as a completed and we update the ERP system, this has been completed. So on a daily basis, on a dashboard level, they get all the information of what has been approved, what has been rejected, where is this currently? Because this approval takes three months. Okay. Okay, that is from my side. Okay. Yeah. So, now that we've seen the videos and we understand, um, when I look at this diagram, I'm thinking about all the things that you could automate in a business that uses websites, daily repetitive tasks, downloading things in Excel, anything where you're clicking from one box, opening a system, extracting, in all these areas of a business, can be automated using a bot. Um, yes, Jen? What about security? Security? Um, can it be stolen around the world? Anything can be stolen, Jen, but um, no. Look, uh, it's about how you build it in relation to, you know, having your security controls, uh, so, Bala and his team are ISO 27001 certified. Um, we are self-assessed certified uh, in, in TNR. So um, yeah, it's, I'm not concerned about from a, a security point of view. 
But um, yeah, I'd encourage everyone to go away and, and I'll email these slides out and have a look at those areas within your business to see things that, that could be automated. Um, in the accounting space, wealth management, emailing quarterly statements out to, um, to, to clients, that can be all automated. Creation of letters, contracts, contracts uh, all those types of things can be automated using a bot. If you have a multi-factor authentication and you do manually, the same thing, what we have done is there is there is a RE technology where in automation anyway. So how how the robotic process starts? It it goes inside the login, it does some process outside. If you have some process to be done outside, it completes that process and login inside the system and a pop-up will come to you with a link or directly to your mobile. To give to put to enter the authentication. Once you enter that authentication, once again the robot will starts. Okay, so somewhere the human inter if 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 it's internal process and you want to bypass that authentication, we can do that. But uh, we have both options. Right. Yeah. And, um, just interesting in uh, fine grain control. Um, you know, you See, see what happens, I'll give an example. I, I'm an accounts payable in your organizations. I will be doing the day-to-day -day activities like seeing the invoice, reading the invoice, finding the vendors inside the ERP systems, going, finding, once the vendor is fine, I go and create an invoice in AP. Okay, if that the whole process is one, two, three, four, five, and daily he's doing the same processes, we can automate the whole processes getting inside the ERP systems. So what happens, example, if your ERP is SAP ERP, on top of that, that is called a platform, that is automation platform, we access the ERP systems as a human and do the data entry job. So you basically set up a specific user in the ERP, or that's like a user? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, so what, what our um, HLV Sydney firm are doing is they've created digital employees uh, which, which do this stuff. Uh, one last comment in relation to chat GPT. Bala, what are you doing in that space? Uh, uh, we, are, we are doing a big investment in chat GPT, okay? And uh, currently we are, we are implementing uh, in HRMS space. And uh, still, it's an initial stage. We have not uh, how, how it will work and how the use cases will be done. But uh, a huge investment we are doing on chat GPT. And uh, in accounting space too, uh, auditing space, we are doing the huge investment. Maybe in a few months, you will get some updates and we can share it to everybody. OK, thank you. OK, um, any final questions? Bala will be here at lunch, so um, I'm sure you'll be asked a few more questions over lunch. But uh, thank you. Oh, sorry, Brad. Um, so in setting up the bot, usually I think you said something maybe last time we visited, but um, you, t you show the bot what to do first, so you can see how the mouse moves, but that's essentially from you showing the bot how to do it. So the limitation of the bot is you did it first and then the bot just replicates that process over and over and over. That's, that's right. And it's, it's really important to have um, your, your process flow documented before you actually do that because you know, I'm sure everyone would know that we don't have, all have our processes documented perhaps the way we should. The other thing that I like about the process that we go through in creating bots is the proof of concept before the bot is created to make sure it actually meets the needs that were intended at the outset. Um, and then you, you iron out any issues before you know, we go and create it in Automate anyway. So thanks, Bala. Um, thanks, thanks Vimal. Oh, Matt, one more, sure. So where a, uh, a data structure changes or something in the background um, that the bot's referencing, yep. you can go in and Good, good question. So they, they need maintenance. Yeah. 
So if the directory changes, then the bot needs to be repointed to where the new directory is. If a, if a website changes, then it needs to be updated. So they, they do need maintenance and, and that's where we're going to be building our own capability to be able to maintain these things. Yeah. Thanks, Bala. Thanks, Vimal. Um, and yeah, let's thank, thank Bala. I'd just like to welcome um, Cameron Bott, our, our next speaker. Cameron is the Executive Director of Westlawn Insurance Brokers. He's um, come up from Melbourne especially for this presentation, so thank you Cameron. He'll be giving us a bit of an overview of some of the current issues in the insurance market that we're all seeing out there, and uh, let's welcome Cameron. Thank, thanks very much, Adam. Yeah. I'll just uh, wait for these uh, slides to come up. But um, yeah, as Adam said, I'm the executive director of Westlawn Insurance Brokers. I got involved with Westlawn just a couple of years ago, but before that, I worked for an insurance company for a long time. And uh, then I started my own broking company, which became the largest private broking company in, uh, in Victoria. And uh, in about 2010, I joined the board of Steadfast and uh, that business went into a, uh, an IPO in 2013, so I sold my business as part of that and stayed on for about five years and had a little bit of time off before I came back into this role. Well, I'm Cameron Bot, but uh, that's with two T's. I've made three bots. Their name are uh, Isabella, Samuel and uh, Harrison. And they're not as smart as uh, Bala's bots. Thank you very much. Well, I've uh, covered off the, the background there. I have mean, mentioned a couple of other things there. I, uh, I own a vineyard and also I own part of a manufacturing company. The only reason I say those things is I'm a purchaser of insurance, which I don't like, but um, I guess when you are purchasing, you, you want to make sure you know what you're buying and what it's going to do in the event of a loss. Westlawn Insurance Brokers, uh, you know, we're you know, got our origins in the Northern Rivers, uh, going back over 50 years. Uh, only 15% of our business is retail, so home, mode and the like. The rest of it is uh, commercial business. And, uh, you know, we do small to medium enterprise organisations right through to large corporate, including public companies. Uh, most of our, our clients have, you know, around the one or 200 mark, but we do have, you know, companies up to the size of 5,000. Uh, employees Mutual, who manage workers' comp claims here in Australia for about 40% of the market, are one of our clients. And our London office, um, you know, it gives us access to be able to place financial lines and high-risk property, which is, um, you know, as an example, AML requires a, uh, a limit of liability on their professional indemnity program of 200 million, so we place that directly into the London market. We've got offices in, in those locations. Brisbane, Cairns, Melbourne, and very soon Sydney are, are all recent additions. So we're expanding the business. Um, I, I would say that in the next couple of years it would be double the size. The things I'm gonna to talk to you guys about today are catastrophe and the impact of that on the insurance market, uh, climate change and the insurance industry and then planning for some of those unplanned outcomes, market trends and claims, and management liability as well. This uh, slide here just shows, you know, the, the, the cost of catastrophe over the last, uh, over the last period. Um, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the, the light blue part there is uh, the, the, those losses attributable to COVID. And this slide here, in particular, the one on the right shows that catastrophe in the last five years has cost uh, double what it cost the, the previous five years. 
And uh, this is some of the effect on one class of insurance, which has a close relationship to uh, Bala's uh, uh, presentation, and that's the cost of uh, cyber insurance. This slide here is an important one, and this sort of uh, you know, impacts how much we pay for insurance and the, the, the lack of capital that's been available, um, the preparedness to invest in insurance with those catastrophes that have been occurring. So after 9-11, you can see on the left-hand side there, that's the, the capital that came back into the insurance market. And then after Katrina, and then after Ian in 2022, there's uh, you know, a much lesser desire to, to enter the market. Now, the other thing I'm going to talk to you about is uh, the impact of, uh, you know, uh, climate change and, and the community and, and what that's going to cost. Um, some of it's insurable, uh, some of it isn't. This is a, a slide that, uh, you know, if you live in Eastern Australia, you're aware of the weather losses that we've had over the last, uh, over the last year. You know, uh, Wheat Westlawn have had 1,500 claims through the Northern Rivers. Uh, some people have losses that they're not insured for, but in Pakistan, you know, 1,700 lives lost, 7, 7 million, I'm sorry, uh, people displaced, but only $5.6 billion of insured loss. And they flip over to Australia where the impact on people is still, you know, not good, 27 lives lost, 60,000 people displaced, but an insured loss much higher at $7.5 billion. This slide here represents the investment that's required over the next or through to 2050 to avoid the worst you know, physical effects uh, of climate change and the gap there of $30 billion and how that's going to be paid for. As I said, over the next, uh, through to 2050, uh, US 125 trillion is required and in the next seven years, that, uh, that amounts 32 trillion. And this is where it's represented, represented sorry. Uh, in Asia, our, right on our doorstep, uh, or the Asia Pacific, you, know, you would see in the news that uh, you know, our friends from China are investing in uh, various uh, countries and building infrastructure, one of the, well, the insurance industry is doing that as well. Um, not so they can take advantage of those vulnerable communities, but so they can help them. And this is how that, uh, that investment's made up. So a bit more down to earth. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about some of those unplanned outcomes. There's one of them. And another one there. So we're seeing claims uh, predominantly in these areas, uh, property with uh, the rising cost of construction, you know, our, We've seen a lot of underinsurance, or indeed, many um, you know many individuals uh, are, are not insured, and those uh, catastrophe losses mainly attributable to weather, um, business interruption where a loss does occur and there's an interruption to the business that's an insurable uh, outcome, and cyber not just those uh, first party losses, the impact on the business, but the loss of data that. Uh, in the different organisations are responsible for. Also, um, I mentioned EML, we're closely related to that organisation. Uh, workers' comp recoveries all around the country. For host employers, those, uh, those losses are ending up on the public and products liability of the, the business owners. Uh, product recall, I mentioned manufacturing. We, um, in my manufacturing company, we took out uh, product recall insurance two years ago, and unfortunately in the last year we've had a $2 million product recall claim. Uh, we're going to talk about management liability in a little bit uh, of time, but uh, yeah, the impact there is on you know, DNO, particularly employment practices and crime. These are some of the issues that we find with you know, large property uh, losses that the uh, that the limits are inadequate. The uh, the limits for uh, accidental damage and removal of debris, you know, the cleaning up of the sites uh, when losses do occur. 
the indemnity period, so from when a loss occurs, the interruption to the business for a period after that. You know, it takes a long time to rebuild and get a business back into the position it would have been had it not been for the loss. And we see uh, very, very often uh, inadequate uh, indemnity periods. And the declared values are often uh, inadequate there with uh, organisations not necessarily getting uh, valuations done regularly. One of the, uh, the key areas to, to protect is those customers and suppliers uh, premises where a loss happens that one of our customers or suppliers and it affects our business, that's, uh, that's insurable as well. And additional increased cost of working. So when you're getting that business back up and running, those additional costs, they're always insurable as well. And claims preparation costs, uh, to prepare a decent claim, we've got one here in Queensland at the moment, which is about a $10 million loss. And the insurers will be spending about $400,000 of their money uh, for us to tell them how much they, they're going to pay uh, and property uh, perils and exclusions. So what's the answer? I guess using the right broker, a good broker costs no more than a, a, a no good one uh, and to understand the risk of the, that are actually within the business um, and make informed decisions about that. You know, we can you know, give you insurance for anything um, but you know, managing the, the business with good business practices is, uh, is a real key, uh, real key to, to being successful. And setting uh, sums insured uh, appropriately. And what we do is we uh, do a business interruption review and we make sure that, uh, you know, that we do the work before the loss so that uh, when and if a loss occurs, we've got a really you know, clear uh, representation of what the insurer should be paying. This is a, an example of a client that we took on uh, about 18 months ago. Um, so they were turning over 420 million then. The sums insured on property were 80 on property and 20 on business interruption. After the review, we sent an increase there of 20 million on the property, but 62 million on the, on the business interruption. So if they had have had a loss at that time, they would have received about 15 cents in the dollar and there's some you know, other considerable changes. So they didn't have uh, DNA, they didn't have crime, they didn't have employment practices, and now they have those, uh, those covers. And they do also have uh, recall expenses, which they didn't have previously. I'm gonna talk about management liability. Um, what that is, is uh, a collection of uh, classes of insurance. There was a new type of insurance that was created about 15 years ago which made uh, you know, smaller businesses be able to purchase those, uh, you know, direct, I'll go into the details. So, these statistics that I'm going to show you is predominantly for businesses with 50 million turnover or less than 200 staff. Usually when you have a business bigger than that, you'll buy these products individually. And these are the, um, so these are the, the, the classes uh, of insurance that are, that are bound up with, within the management liability cover. So you've got directors and officers liability, uh, statutory, those fines and penalties, uh, crime, entity cover, uh, occupational health and safety, that's again, uh, the fines and penalties that come out of that area, employment practices liability, uh, tax and official. So of uh, this representation, which this particular insurer uh, does about 25% of the Australian market, so it's a, it's, a, it's a really good sample, but 35 claims are, are over half a million and 11 claims are, are over one, one million, so it's important to, to know that claims get much larger than that, but that goes up when we have uh, larger organisations. This particular insurer, um, which is Dual Australia, they had uh, probably one of Australia's largest uh, crime losses where their claims manager set up a fake uh, law firm and paid them $17.4 million of fees, which went into her account. Thankfully, she invested the money wisely. She paid the ATO and bought a house, so I got all the money back. And this just shows the, the areas where the, the, the claims are occurring. So employment practices, that's the, you know, that's, the, that's the real big one there at 40%. So that's unfair dismissal, et cetera, et cetera. 
This is um, the statutory liability OH&S explained. So there's about 500 pieces of legislation that you know business owners need to be aware of and, and work with and work around, but they don't always get it right. And this uh, this cover provides for, for protection on that front. You can see the average cost of the claim there, and for SME clients, is about seventy thousand um, dollars. Employment practices. I touched on that before. Uh, Forty percent of the claims uh, under management liability are employment practices claims, and uh, forty percent of those are attributable there for unfair dismissal. Uh, crime. Uh, I touched on that. Our friends at TNR would uh, would pick up these sorts of uh, these sorts of losses, but quite often they go undetected for uh, quite a long time, uh, and often the the people the people that we trust the most uh, created these uh, these losses. Forty percent. It takes over five years of this going on before they're discovered. And there, my details. Chris was here yesterday. As was Joe. Chris is our Northern Rivers uh, manager and Joe's based in you know, Lismore Casino and Mwilumba. But uh, yeah, if you would like any help or guidance, you can contact us and we'll do our best to, to help out. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. So basically what you're telling us is our premiums are going to go up and our le level of cover is going to decrease. Thanks, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and it's probably a timely reminder that you know we should all review our insurances. Um, something I think it's good practice. Look, that wraps up today. Lunch will be served um, at twelve thirty if it's not out there already. Thanks for coming. Appreciate your support. Hope you got something out of it. It was worthwhile. Um, Bala has in the background developed a bot so we don't have to work this afternoon. Thanks, Bala. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, stick around um, and thank you.